It's a beautiful day to sing praises to our Lord, but can we praise him if it would be cloudy out? Our first song is called, How Can I Keep From Singing, and is based on a text by Robert Lowry, a pastor from the 1800s who wrote around 500 gospel tunes. And uh, I'm going to read the first verse of Robert Lowry's version. The version we're going to sing is a little bit different. My life flows on in endless song, above earth's lamentation. I hear the sweet though far off him that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and strife, I hear the music ringing. It finds echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? It's beautiful words to remind us that we have so much to praise him for through the good times, the bad, cloudy days, sunny days. So please rise and join us in praising God in Chris Tomlin's version of How Can I Keep From Singing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. 
opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to continue our worship as we give back to you something very practical, money. May it come from hearts of love and may it be as worship to you because you have given us so many things. You are so good. Thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for our country. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for the peace that we have enjoyed over the years, for the prosperity you have given, for the great harvest weather. Father, you are so good. We could go on and on, but we just want to say thank you. And we can say thank you in the good times, and and as we learned in Sunday school, Father, we can say thank you too in the bad times. I know it's tougher, but we can. We say thank you. And now pray that you would use these gifts as a gift of love to you and as worship to you. May you use them. May you bless them. May they accomplish what you have for them to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
is the big family that I have been blessed with because we always have so much fun and there is never a dull moment. Hi, I'm Joelle and I'm thankful for my family because they're always there for me and probably when I don't need them to when I do. <laughs> and I'm very thankful for a warm house to come to in the winter. I'm Mim, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to live abroad. the seasons and just how they change every few months. I'm Gage and I'm very thankful for my health and just be able to come up here and sing today. We would like to invite you all to stand and sing the last verse with us, please. stand and sing with us um, Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait
rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
God, we wait your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we your bride as your body that we are longing for the day that you will come but let us not just be sitting idly by waiting but let us be busy about your work about your kingdom about letting other people know that you are coming and that there is hope and that there is life in you and that we're getting ready ourselves we're learning how to worship we're learning how to love you we're learning how to be a body so, Lord, we ask that, that you would touch each one of our hearts, that we're all ready to see you. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you that you are the everlasting God. You are the eternal God. You are the one true God. You are our Lord. You're wonderful, and you are precious. You're our counselor. You're our comforter. And those are just a few of your attributes and a few of your names. But, Lord, we just come before you, acknowledge that you are God. And ask for your blessing, ask for your work and your touch on our lives. And as Pastor Scott comes, I just pray that you would touch him too. That you would bless him, give him the words to say, the boldness and clarity of thought in which to say them. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin this morning, I want to, um, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to read a passage of scripture that is not where I'm preaching from this morning. I'd like for us to to pray. Um, the terrorist attacks in, in Paris, you know, hit me on Friday afternoon, and I, you know, t talked to my, or texted my wife, and I said, you know, look at what's happening here, and I started getting uh, very glued to the, 
to what was happening at that point in time when, when I heard about it. And, and, you know, you pray and you ask God, what, you know, how are we supposed to be dealing with all of this sort of thing? And sometimes our initial reaction is, is probably not the, the right one. And so um, I just was looking around uh, for something to grab a hold of uh, from the Lord to kind of give us a, a little clearer sense of direction there. And so um, Psalm chapter 37, uh, verses 7 through 11, it's a psalm of David, and he says this. He says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, even the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Please join me as we pray here. Dear Heavenly Father, another day of terror-making darkness, evil-doing madness, and life-taking sadness. How long, O oh Lord, how long before you send Jesus back to eradicate all evil? How long before the wicked will be no more? How much longer is just a little while? It's hard not to fret. It's hard not to feel fearful and angry when women and children, the young and old, are mercilessly slaughtered in the city of Paris, when restaurants, concert halls, and sports arenas become the venue for the perversion of religion and the murder of your image bearers. Father, we offer our prayer not in self-righteous judgment, but as your weary children, longing for the day when the knowledge of your glory will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, when perfect peace will replace every expression of evil. Until that day, free us from all bitterness and a lust for revenge. Vengeance belongs to you, not to us. Make us warriors of peace and agents of hope. Our labors in the Lord are never in vain. You remind us of that in your word. The gospel of the kingdom will prevail. Defeated evil will be eradicated evil. The devil is filled with fury, for he knows his time is short. Make it much shorter. Make it much shorter, Father. Grant us wisdom to know what loving mercy, doing justice, and walking humbly with you looks like in Paris and in our own communities. Replace our frets and fears with faith and trust and our rage and wrath with patience and courage. So we pray in Jesus' triumphant and graceful name. Amen. We continue to go through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I, I have to let you know that today we'll be going through 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to take a break after chapter 9 for a little bit. We have some Thanksgiving season coming up. We have uh, Advent season coming up, and so I figured we'd take a little bit of a break to kind of focus in on the season, but we'll go through chapter 9. Uh, today and if you remember where we were last week, we were talking about the Apostle Paul and talking about food being offered to idols and you know whether you can eat that or not or how you should deal with that sort of thing. And at the very end of chapter eight, what he said is this: He said, "Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble." Okay. So Paul declares that. He's willing to become a vegetarian, right, for the sake of a brother, to make sure that he doesn't cause him to stumble. He continues on in chapter 9. He doesn't break away from this thought. And so it's kind of good that we get to go there today because last week as we were talking about this, some questions came up in my mind, in the minds of others as well. 
And, you know, some of those questions is, well, how much? You know, how much do you give in for the sake of looking out for a brother? How much is it do we have to listen from people who might just be critical of us? And how much of it is do we have to, you know, uh, look out for this weaker brother or this one who has the more scruples, as we put it last week? And so Paul continues on. He doesn't start off like he did in chapter 8 where he said, now concerning this, in chapter 7, now concerning this. And so he just jumps right in in chapter 9, and he continues on with this sort of, uh, this sort of um, uh, thought in mind, this idea. I want to ask you this. Answer any of these things if you can. I'm not asking you questions, but you might need to complete what I'm saying. You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer any questions. Anything you say may be held against you, used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney uh, before speaking to the police. If you cannot afford an attorney, some of you have been arrested. (laughs) Watch it on TV. Yes, yes, we watch it on TV, right. Okay, Um, if you decide to answer questions now without an attorney present, you will still have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to an attorney. These are the basic ideas of this, something called the Miranda rights or the Miranda uh, reading. And it's the idea that when police make an arrest to somebody, they have to let them know what their rights are. Because if the person doesn't know what their rights are, they don't know if they're going to violate their rights or they're going to not know how to necessarily protect themselves. This is not the case with the Apostle Paul. He knows very clearly what his rights are. And the people in Corinth didn't necessarily think that Paul was deserving of his rights. And so he continues on in chapter 9 to talk about this idea of of his rights and how he's willing to limit his liberties for the sake of love, right? Right? Limiting his liberties for the sake of love. And so when I talk about liberties, I'm talking about the idea of rights, it's something that you have the authority to do, okay? And in terms of or the freedom to do, in terms of liberties, it's these things that we have the freedom, freedom to do. We, we, we have the freedom to, to, to do lots of different things, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here. But the idea of purposely choosing to limit your freedom for the sake of of love. Is that something we're willing to do? Let's look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about this for himself. So we'll read from chapter 9. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me there, okay? He says this, continuing on from chapter 8, he says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If To others, I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier in his own, at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman would plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure everything, anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. 
For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might, be, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or crown, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So as we're reading through this here, I told you here, the Apostle Paul right out is coming off of this, I will, I will never eat meat uh, uh, unless I make my brother stumble. And so he gets into now um, talking about his rights here, okay? And so he first thing he says is, um, and it's for us as well, is that each of us has certain rights, okay? Each of us has certain rights, certain liberties, certain freedoms that we enjoy, certain things of, of which we, you know, call them rights, call them privileges, however you choose to call them. I just put them as rights there because it's the shortest uh, word I can fit in that line there. And Paul says, hey, I have some rights too. I have some authority here. So each of us has some rights, okay? Each of us has some rights. Look at what he says. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Of course he's free. Of course he's an apostle. In case there was any question about that, he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Right? If these other guys are really wise ministers, they're really great teachers, they're full of, of, uh, of wisdom and, and, and knowledge, what about Paul as somebody who's seen Jesus? Right? The idea of an apostle is somebody who is commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ directly. This is what the apostle Paul says. He has this authority. And it's not in, it's not in anybody's mind in terms of it being questioned by people who know the facts. But for some reason or another, the Corinthians thought, hey, maybe because Paul, he, he doesn't act like this way around us. Maybe it's because he really doesn't have the authority to do this around us. And see, that would be a, a mistake to make. Because Paul had all the authority to be able to demand of them and to push them and to command them to walk according to the ways of the Lord. As an apostle of Jesus Christ, as somebody who brought them the gospel, as somebody who declared he was a father to them. Doesn't your father get to tell you what to do? Oh, <laughs> at least that's the way I understand the role, huh? Right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So he, he's saying here, you know, have I, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If there's any question about it, look at I brought you the gospel. And you've been growing. And look what else he says. He says, uh, if, if to others I am not an apostle, maybe other people don't respect me. They don't know who I am or anything like that. And that's okay. They don't know me. I'm from somewhere else. But you know me, right? You know me. He says, uh, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship of the Lord. He says this a little bit differently in, in 2 Corinthians as well. He talks about them being, uh, uh, in terms of credentials, that they are his credentials, basically, so, to that effect. And so, here it is. He's establishing his authority. He's establishing his right, okay? And now what you think 
is that, oh, he wants to do this because we grew up in an age where you watch TV guys, right, the TV preachers, and they're going to tell you all this stuff because you know it's coming, right? You're waiting for the other shoe to drop, which is give me some money, right? Give me some money. I haven't asked you for it yet, but I'm going to ask you for it, right? That's, that's what we think, and we're a little bit jaded in that. Here's what Paul says. He says, I'm an apostle. I, I, have, I have all of this. There, uh, th- these rights here. I've seen Jesus. Okay, I brought you the gospel. Uh, you know what I've what I've done in terms of teaching you and establishing this church. There, this is what he says here in verse three. He says, "This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink?" He says, "I'm free at first, right? Doesn't everybody have the right to eat and drink? Pastors don't, right?" Yeah. We need to keep them humble so that they will be spiritual, right? We're not like that here, okay? Uh, it's just funny there. Um, this, this past week, um, I, was invi- I was invited to, to, to pray at a Veterans Day celebration. And after that celebration, one of the ladies came to me and said, you know, come and join us for the luncheon, you know, and, and your whole family is invited too, you know. And so I was talking with uh, some of the guys in the church about that, and they said, well, we take that very seriously. If you pray for us, we do not muzzle the ox. We make sure that you have something to eat too, you know. But Paul says here, sorry, I digressed. Uh, uh, this is my defense to you who would examine me. Do, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? So he's saying this is common practice there. And these guys are being funded, if you will, supported to be able to, to carry out this ministry. Paul says, don't I have the right to do that too? Listen to what he says in verse 6. Or is it only Bar- uh, Barnabas and I who have no right to to refrain from working for a living, right? So he's still working, right? Paul said he's a tent maker there. He chose to do that. He chose to do that because he didn't want to uh, somehow or another cause any sort of um, uh, negativity associated with the gospel. He wanted to make sure that they saw that what he was bringing them was free, and he wanted to give them the truth freely. He didn't want them to think that he, he was doing it because he expected them to give him some money and to take care of him that way. He wanted to make it clear that way. If he takes care of himself, he doesn't need them to take care of him, and he can say that. I don't need you to do this for me. I don't need your money. I've taken care of myself. God has provided this for me. I don't need that. And so he wants to make very clear to them that he doesn't need it, okay? Okay? Why? Because he's going to tell him he wants it, right? No, 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 all right? No. He says, or is it only Bar- uh, Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier in his, at his own expense? Any military people here? Ex-military? Yeah. You didn't go there and say, okay, I'm going to go get a job here so I can serve in the service. I have to raise my support so I can go into the army and go fight overseas, right? You don't, it doesn't work like that. This is what Paul says. It's really, it's kind of, you know, a, a clear understanding of how it should be. And I think we get it, except for sometimes we don't. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Okay? So he just puts it out there very simply and says, hey, this is how it is, right? These are things that should be happening normally, right? I should... I should, as somebody who is serving in the gospel, be able to make my living from the gospel. And he says so much as that a little bit later on. Verse 8, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the, the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? So right there, he's, he, he establishes it from Scripture even, okay? From Scripture. He says in the law of Moses, it says that, right? It's written there in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 25, verse 4, and then also uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 7, or some, somewhere around there, where this is, these things are quoted, okay? Jesus quotes the Old Testament. Paul quotes, uh, quotes Jesus in, in, in Luke. And so you have it out there. And so he's saying, you know, th- where this came here, where it says, is it for even for, for God concerned about oxen? Is that why God put that in the Bible? 
And here it is. He explains that. Verse 10, does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? So as he was going through all of this, he's saying, I have certain rights. I'm an apostle. I'm entitled. Entitled. Yes, that word entitled. Entitled really means somebody is entitled. It means that they're deserving of it, okay? We use that word and we say, that person thinks they're entitled. They're entitled to this. Hey, I don't know how you feel about certain things, but if I put money into something, I feel I should be entitled to get that money back to me, okay? And that's my sense of entitlement, okay? Paul says here, he says, I'm entitled for this. I'm entitled to this. Though he's entitled to it, he doesn't demand it. As a matter of fact, he doesn't make use of his right in this, and he tells us that in just a little bit. But before I, I jump there, this idea of, of muzzling the ox, and just to, for us to understand, well, why did they talk about an ox then if he didn't care about the ox if it was just for people? Well, because sometimes those little kind of wise little slogan saying things communicate a lot of truth. So if you're, if you're having a discussion with somebody and you pre- present some sort of argument there about, about something, they might say to you, that dog won't hunt. You ever heard that term? I know you have. I know you have. That dog won't hunt. Anybody ever heard that? No? Okay. And so the idea is that what you're saying, it doesn't really apply here. It doesn't, it's not going to give you any, any sort of credibility or validate what you're saying as you use that saying. But it has nothing to do with whether a dog is hunting or not right at that point in time. Right? It's a saying to communicate a, a simple little truth. And so this is the idea of this, you know, uh, don't muzzle the ox, which is exactly what was used this week when I was talking to a couple of guys there. They used the exact same term there, you know. I thought, am I an ox? No, I'm not. Okay. But anyways, so he says, if others share this rightful claim to you, do not we even more, uh, chapter, uh, uh, verse 12, A. Okay? So he says, if you're going to go and pay these other, quote, unquote, apostles, and you're going to look to them and say, oh, I respect them. They're so wise. They're so knowledgeable. They're so eloquent when they speak. All that sort of thing. You can go and hold them up all you want. But when it was all said and done, right, Paul was the one who planted the church. Paul was the one who brought them the gospel. Paul was the one who suffered for their sake. So you can look at all of that stuff and say, ooh, 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 ooh. But it's the person who did the nitty-gritty is the one who's actually deserving of it. And in this case, he says, hey, uh, if others uh, share the rightful claim on you, do not we even more. So he made it very clear. He knows his rights. He knows the authority he has there. He's letting them know. And he's going to tell them why he's chosen not to exercise that. Verse uh, 12b. He says, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded, hello, this is not just Paul saying this, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So now that he's explained to them that he has this right, he says, I'm not doing this. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. He doesn't want to put an obstacle there. His decision for doing what he's doing is all about the gospel. If there should seem to be like, oh, Paul seems to be this way. You know, when he's with the Jewish people, he's really Jewish, right? When he's with the Gentiles, he eats pork. You know, this guy is like inconsistent. You know, and that's kind of how we would look at it. Paul is like, no, the whole center of my life is about proclaiming the gospel, and I don't want to do anything to hinder that. And so I'm going to make sure that the choices I choose are about getting the gospel out, proclaimed clearly, freely, boldly for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of my Lord Jesus Christ. So he says here, we didn't make use of the right. 
And isn't it just normal anyway? Don't you know that those who are employed in the temple service get to eat their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, it's supposed to happen there with the gospel. Verse 15 says here, and this is the second point, we have the right to not make use of our rights. Okay? We have the right to not make use of our rights. Okay? Verse 15 But I have made no use of any of these rights. I just took it out of the text, okay? But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any uh, such provision. See what I mean? He's already knowing what they're thinking, and he's, he's, he's aware of that, you know? I know that they think as I'm writing this, they probably think I'm gonna hit them up for some money and tell them why they need to give it to me after I just laid the big guilt trip on them already. And he says, I want them to know that that's not why I'm doing it. So I didn't make use of this right. And he says, nor am I writing of these things now, right, to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. What is he going to boast about? He's going to boast about how he presents the gospel freely. We find this out a little bit later on. How he presents the gospel freely without asking anybody for anything. Because he wants to be able to do that. So here... Uh, verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, right? He's got to preach the gospel. Why? Because Jesus Christ commanded him to go and preach the gospel. So he doesn't really have a, a choice in that matter. He doesn't really have anything where he can say, well, I, 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 can, I can do it this way or I can do it this way. He says, for if I, if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. Why? Jesus told him he had to preach the gospel. That's duty, Okay, but look at what he says here. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Okay, verse 17. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. So he says, if I, if I willingly preach the gospel, and he's going to say willing, pre- willingly preach it without charge, he says that's something I get to choose to do. Okay, but preaching the gospel, I don't get to choose to do. It's my duty. And so verse 17, for if I do this of my own will, that is preaching the gospel without charge, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. I still have to carry out what the Lord has given to me, and I have to be faithful with that stewardship. What then is my reward? That in preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. See, even though he could do it, he says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to hinder anybody. I don't want to put up any obstacles there. I want to make sure that the gospel gets out there. It's proclaimed clearly. I don't want anything, any any encumbrances of it, right? I'm going to make sure I clear that all out. So sometimes, you know, one of the things there um, in churches and stuff, they'll have like dinners and stuff, right, or some sort of um, uh, uh, gathering together, and they'll offer a free supper to people so that they say, I don't want you to think that this is about money, and we're going to cook this meal so that you'll pay for it, and then we get a chance to, you know, to present the gospel or do something else for, for you, or we do anything else to try to make money, right? We're trying to present the gospel, and so they'll say, we'll do it for free, or we'll say, put a donation there if you choose to do that. Right? But the idea is not about the money, even though it costs money to do it, right? Correct? Right? Yeah. And so sometimes you'll do things like that because you, want, you don't want anybody to get um, jaded in any way. You don't want them to get uh, uh, to feel somehow or another like there is, uh, there, there's something else besides the real deal there. You want to remove any of that so that they can see, see clearly. This is a place here. You come and eat because we care about you. We care about you so much we want to share the gospel with you. We want to share the gospel with you so that you can know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have the same hope and promise of eternal life that we have. If you start to tie a lot of different things to that, it really kind of muddies the waters as to what the message is about. So here it is. Paul says here, we have the right not to use the right. I'm choosing to exercise my right not to use my right. Okay? Verse 19 here says, um, for though I am free from all, and here's the third point. He says, uh, I, say, I, I put it like this, it takes a loser to be a winner. And I put loser in quotes because I, I don't want you to think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, baggage attached to that word, Okay? 
Somebody who's a loser in this case is somebody who's willing to lose their rights for the sake of the gospel. This is what he says. Here's Paul's secret. For though I am free from all, right? He keeps on coming back to that. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. There's no reason I have to do this. I'm free to do what I do. And so he says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. So getting back to the idea of how much is too much, Paul says, hey, look it. I'm willing to be a servant of all so that I might win some. What are we willing to do? To what degree are you willing to see somebody you care about come to know Jesus Christ? When I used to counsel young people, they'd say, you know, my mom and dad are on me. And their parents weren't believers. My mom and dad are on me all the time here because my room is messy and stuff like that. And it's so hard for me to do. And they're unrealistic and wanting me to keep it clean. You know how kids can be, right? Like that's unrealistic. And I would tell them, I'd say, what if... Keeping your room clean made it easier for your parents to come to Christ because they saw your witness. Would you be willing to do it then? And then you find out, oh, I'm not so concerned about my parents because it's too hard for me, you know? Sadly to say. But it's like that for us, right? What would we be willing to do? Paul says here, I'm willing to be a servant of all. I have made myself a servant of all that I might win more of them. Verse 20, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. Doesn't mean that he became a Jew. He was a Jew from before. He knew what they believed. And so the idea is when he's hanging out with these guys there, he's not going to say, you know what? You're wrong in what you believe. Jesus is the Messiah. And just go and nail them with that all the way, right? Right from the get-go. He might in an an exchange, he might. But the first thing you don't do to somebody you're trying to win them is just go up to them and say, you're... You know, I have a friend who used to, he's actually, he's a preacher now, all right? But before he'd say, you know, to people, you're all sinners and you're going to hell. Is that true? If you don't know Christ, that's true, right? But is that the first thing out of your mouth when you meet people? No, because they don't understand, right? You have to have a context. Amen? And so here it is. He says, when I'm with the Jewish people, I'm Jewish, Not that he observes all the Jewish laws or anything like that, but does he have to eat pork when he's around these people? No. He chooses not to. What about when he's with the Gentiles? To to the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under law, that I might win those under the law. So even though, you know, if these guys are out there and, and, and for them, they're not, like, once again, it's, you know, use pork, for example. They're not eating pork. He's not going to demand that, that, that they serve him pork and that he eats it in front of them to show how free he is. He's going to act like they are in the sense that, yeah, I'll eat the same sort of thing. I'm not going to be exactly like them. And there's, no, there's nothing in here that says, oh, because they're sinners, you just go right ahead and be a sinner. You go and do exactly what they're doing. That's not the idea here. He's saying to the Jews, I'm this way. And Paul says, uh, I became as one under the law, though my, not, my, not being myself under the law. But he talks about being under the law of Christ, that I might win those under the law. Verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So he just explains it there. He's under the law of Christ, but he's going to go be with the Gentiles. And if he's with the Gentiles, does that mean he's going to be a Gentile? No. But if they're eating pork... He can eat pork. That's fine. And when he talks to them, he says, I want to talk to you about the unknown God, right? He's contextualizing his message to them. He wants them to know that he understands something about them, and he wants to communicate the truth to them, the gospel. And so in this case here, here's what it is. He says uh, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. This is his commitment. Why does he do this? Verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So his idea there is that he wants the gospel to go out there and he wants the people to come to know Christ so that he can share in the fellowship with them. This is why Paul does what he does. Why do we do what we do? Is this some 
like deep missionary training that he has, and he says this is only for him and not for anybody else. He told us earlier there in, in chapter 4, right, he said, imitate me. He's going to say it in chapter 11 too. Be imitators of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. He's giving us a model. This is what our leadership is supposed to be about when we have this kind of influence on other people. It's that we model what it means to follow the Lord and to put him first. We don't always do it perfectly. That's okay. But we, what we need to do is have that at the heart of things is that it's for Christ and for the gospel that I do what I do. I do it all for the sake of the gospel is what he says here. Verse 24, and we're going to wind down here in just a minute. Verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. So now he uses it as something that they would be familiar with. It was called the Isthmian Games, okay? And it was second only to the Olympic Games there. It would take place every two or three years around Corinth there, and there would be people running races. There'd be people boxing, there'd be people wrestling, they'd be doing all those sorts of things there. And so Paul uses this example and he says, look at how these athletes are training. They train in such a way that they want to win the prize. You know, I was watching this, um, this uh, uh, show, kind of a documentary on, on bodybuilding there, and they, they kind of follow this, these guys into the Mr. Olympia bio, uh, bodybuilding contest that took place in 2012. And there was this guy who was the favorite, and this guy was the favorite, and, and you know, we weren't sure who was going to win, and this guy had won so many. And so they kind of follow these guys along to see what they're doing, what their mindsets are, and what they're doing, and they are focused on what they're doing. I mean, everything they do, they, what they eat is about how they're going to look when they get up there to, to compete, right? With, when they sleep is, gonna, you know, is, is all about you know, what they're going to look like when they get up there. Right? Everything is about that. That's their focus. And so Paul is saying, here's this kind of discipline. Are we willing to be disciplined like this? He says, uh, uh, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And this disqualified is not talking about him losing his salvation. It's the idea of him losing a reward here, his reward of what he had talked about earlier, to be able to boast about preaching the gospel without charge. So that's his focus. So he runs a race wanting to win. He's like one who boxes, he wants to win, right? He doesn't run aimlessly. He doesn't just go, you know, I'm a shadow box, I'm going to go like this, right? If you want to play a musical instrument, right, you got to practice properly. You can't just go, I'm making all sorts of no noise on my flute, right? You have to practice properly, right? And so here it is, this idea about being focused. What are we willing to do for the sake of the gospel? And so I think... Looking at how Paul deals with all of this, some of the questions that may have come up from last week there about, you know, how much and, and how little and all that sort of thing is whatever it takes. Are we willing to limit our liberties for love? For love of our brother and sister in Christ to make sure they don't stumble? For the love of the lost, that they might come to know Jesus Christ. That's the question you all have to ask ourselves. And if that's what we're willing to do, then amen. We have the right spirit. We have the right heart. If we're not willing to do that, maybe we don't have the right spirit, the right heart. You know, you have the right to do lots of different things, but you don't have to exercise that right. You have the right to go to to get a hunting license. You have a right to get a hunting license. You have a right to get a fishing license. You have a right to get a driver's license, okay? You have a right not to get a hunting license. You have a right not to get a fishing license. You have a right not to choose to drive, right? You have that right. So it's just how we're going to exercise these, these rights that we have for the sake of the gospel. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you're, it's legal to do it doesn't necessarily make it right. Right? All these kinds of things we have to, you know, we just put it in there and say, for the sake of the gospel, I'm willing to renounce my rights. I'm willing to limit my liberties for the sake of those who are lost, out of love. 
So let us let that be our our idea in all of this. You know, what did we take from chapters eight and nine? The idea that we're willing to let go of something that we have a right to for the sake of somebody who's lost and for that purpose. And you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to be taken advantage of or not. It kind of happens in Christianity a lot anyway. Thank Jesus, right? But the idea is that we want to get the word out there. We want to get the gospel out there. We want people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ like we've come to know him. We want people to know the forgiveness of sins. We want people to know the rest that is found in Jesus Christ. We want people to know the hope of eternal life. Because if you look on TV and you see what's happening in the world, right, there's not a lot of hope out there. So we need to make sure we do what we can to get it out there. Let's stand and we'll pray and I'll send us on our way. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that in your grace and in your mercy, you have helped us to see the light to see our need for Jesus Christ and to come before you, God, and to lay our sins at the feet of the cross and to know forgiveness and to know the hope and the promise of eternal life. We were not deserving of any of that. We still aren't deserving of any of it. But it's because of who you are and because of your goodness, oh God. And so we come this morning thanking you for that. We also come knowing that with all that we have received from you, Lord, and all the, the rights and privileges that we enjoy, that we can even be willing to limit some of those rights that we have, rights that are given to us in this country, rights that are given to us because we live in a free society, Lord, for the sake of the gospel. Because what matters most is not that we live in a free society, but that the gospel is proclaimed and continues to grow because this is how Jesus Christ is glorified. Help us to be single in our focus. Help us to be single in our purpose. Help us to have this singleness of mind as we live our lives, Lord. Serious, yes, but focus for you, Lord, and enjoying fellowship with you as we serve you. For this is what you have called us to do and to be. So we pray that we might be and do that. Thank you for giving us this time together this morning. And now as we leave this place, Lord, we pray that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and always. Amen. You are dismissed. This has been a ministry of the Grace Bible Church. If you're looking for a church home or you would just like to come and visit, please be assured of a warm welcome. Our Sunday school begins at 9.45 and the morning service at 10.45.